Today for the adult portion of our teaching, I'd like to talk about something uh, that is found in traditional Buddhist teaching that is a very important element of the, of the path, of the teaching. And that is that a great deal of time is spent initially in practices and contemplations and thoughts that turn the mind toward Dharma. These are the, these are uh, actually the phrasing, that's the phrasing that's actually used uh, to describe these kinds of teachings. The practice of turning the mind toward Dharma is, is accomplished in many different ways. And one of the ways is that one is given a series of thoughts And these thoughts are contemplated on extensively. And these are thoughts that the Buddha actually indicated to us. Thoughts about cyclic existence or the cycle of death and rebirth. The cycle of death and rebirth that we are involved in right now is called cyclic existence or samsara. And we are given to understand different factors about cyclic death and rebirth. For instance, we are understanding that everything that is born must die. These are not new things to us. You know, everyone that is human realizes that everyone that is born must die. Um, We've seen birth and we've seen death and we've seen it over and over again. Yet, somehow, the way that our minds work, we seem to ignore that fact. Uh, We we think of ourselves as something that uh, will live forever. And we think that uh, if we don't do it today, we can do it tomorrow. And then we do it tomorrow, we can do it the next day. And... Pretty soon we find out that we're just about 85 years old and we haven't done anything that we said we were going to do. And that becomes really frightening. So the Buddha gives us a remedy as to how to deal with that by teaching us that everything that is born must die. And we are also taught that everything is impermanent. Um, That is to say that all conditions are impermanent. Because sometimes, even though we realize that, we realize that nothing we have ever seen lasts forever still we, we come to understand also, we, we come to forget rather also that um, conditions actually do change in that every time we achieve some kind of happiness, we think this is it. I've got it now. I've got it now. Now if nothing moves, if everything just stays just the way it is, I've got it right now. And of course we find a false kind of security in that. And we build up our hopes for that and then we become very disappointed But the strange factor is that when we become disappointed, we don't really understand the cause of our disappointment. Uh, We forget that we were taught that everything is impermanent. And we forgot to expect that even our happiness would be impermanent. We forgot to expect that. We said, oh, we've got this happiness now and it's going to stay here and therefore (coughs) I've made it. And sometimes we feel that way when we have a new job. Sometimes we feel that way when we have a new house. Sometimes we feel that way when we have a new car, even something like a car. You know, we get in our new red sports car and we think, now I'm going to be happy. And we forget that all of that is impermanent. And sometimes we find a a relationship or sometimes we find a marriage or sometimes we find some personal success that teaches us that from this point on, everything is going to be good and everything is going to be happy. And we forget, the Buddha teaches us that everything is impermanent. Everything is impermanent. Then also sometimes when we're in the terrible suffering, uh, we forget that we have ever been happy. We forget that um, we have ever experienced anything called happening and we think that our suffering is going to go on forever and ever and ever and we are helpless in the face of our suffering uh, at the loss of a loved one or um, at uh, conditions arising in the life that are they're painful we think that everything is bleak and black and terrible. And so we forget that everything is impermanent. Whatever it is, we seem to forget that the status of our life is impermanent and we just hook into the phenomena that we see right in front of our face. And that seems to be all that we can see for some reason. We are not able to step back from our lives and get the big picture. We don't really see our lives as, a, as a, a, a page, really, in a very long book. The Buddha teaches us that we have been reborn again and again and again, not just once, not ten times, not a hundred times, but many, many, many uncountable times. The Buddha's teaching is that we have been self-existent or thinking of ourselves as self-existent. And that means revolving in birth and death experiences since time out of mind, inconceivable time. 
That means such a long time ago that our minds cannot wrap around the concept of how much time. The Buddha teaches us that we have thought of ourselves as being self-existent for that long and therefore revolved in cyclic existence. So that we've had many different kinds of experiences in our lives. Our, our experiential repertoire, if you will, is like a very, very large book. And every life that we have is just the turning of a page in the book. But while we're in the middle of that life, we don't think of it that way. We don't think that anything that we did in the past had very much importance. And we don't think that when anything we're doing right now has very much importance because we don't see that it's going to absolutely dictate our experience in the future. We don't understand that. We think that whatever we do now is simply that, what we do now. Even though we understand just by seeing that there is some cause and effect, it must be so. I can drop something and it will fall. The cause is dropping and, and gravity and the, the result is the falling. So we know that there is cause and effect, but we don't understand cause and effect well enough to know that what we do right now is so important that it will dictate the experience that we have in the future. And like I was explaining to the children, if we interact with one another in a prideful way, according to the Buddha's teaching, that is the root cause, that is the cause that will absolutely ensure that at some point in the future we are victimized by someone else's pride. Cause and effect relationships keep on rising interdependently. They simply, dependent upon one another, arise and, and engage and, and interact and bring about more cause and effect relationships. And since we don't really understand that, we keep creating the causes for future unhappiness. These are such simple teachings. And I have found that while these are the basic fundamental teachings that turn the mind toward Dharma, there never comes a time in a Dharma practitioner's life when they no longer need to hear these teachings. There never comes a time until we reach a supreme enlightenment where we don't any longer need to hear these teachings. And the reason why is that the nature of our minds is such that we cro constantly and chronically forget. We're so forgetful. It's, it's, just, it's really unbelievable. Um, sometimes I can see a practitioner, uh, a very sincere practitioner, one who has been practicing for some time, perhaps even someone who has taken robes as an ordained person, uh, engaging in some, some, some anger-producing activity, some hate-producing activity, or some selfishness. And I can, can ask that practitioner, what do you think you're going to accomplish by this? How are you going to be happy in the future by this kind of activity? And even someone that has been practicing Dharma for a long time will say, yes, but I have a reason for feeling this way, and I have a reason for doing this. And I have to come back and say, yes, but remember the teaching. What are you producing for yourself now? In the future, you will engage in the same kind of activity. You'll engage in the same kind of activity because you are feeding the habit of doing that now. And yet, each one of us forgets. We forget cause and effect relationship. It's like that little boy said, Aaron, he said, it's best to back down. Just back down. It's so easy. Just, just drop it. Just let it go. But we can't do that because we, we, th we're so tied up in our current experience that we forget that everything we do now brings about a whole chain of cause and effect relationships that will ripen in the future. I was thinking yesterday about about the earth. Um, I went to uh, visit um, a natural preserve called Assateague. Do you know where Assateague is? It's uh, right next to Chincoteague. Um, it's related to the Chesapeake Bay and it's really a very a very wonderful place. And uh, there's there's drought there now. Usually it's a, it's a water swampy kind of area and these water birds um, have a great deal of, of, of the kind of natural terrain that they need in order to to live and, and to, to eat food. And uh, there's almost, there are almost no birds there now because they're having a drought there. And I know to some degree that that's seasonal, but I've been there for years and, uh, in a row, and this is the worst year I've ever seen it. And I thought to myself, what is it? What's happening here? What is this event? And I was thinking about actually all of the, all of the world situation. There are so many different areas of the world that are so 
terribly imbalanced, you know. Uh, we're losing our rainforests, as you know, and our rainforests are absolutely essential. They are part of the body of this earth. They, they're required in order for the earth to survive. And I'm thinking about how uh, we have destroyed certain life forms, um, hunted them to the point that they are in extinct. They were part of the whole body of earth. And, and there are so many ways in which our high level of technology has robbed the earth of certain resources. And we can never, never repair what has been lost so far. And I'm thinking about how what we see now in terms of drought, uh, in terms of great difficulty that the earth experiences where um, some parts of the earth have actually turned to wasteland because we have over farmed them and overused them, uh, that the earth has undergone such radical changes including high level of pollution in the atmosphere and all of that. I don't mean to be an ecologist, but um, and I'm not, but it's obvious that there have been some terrible changes. They are due to steps that we took a long time ago. Maybe, maybe only 10 years ago, but maybe 100 years ago. Maybe 200 years ago. Things that we began to develop as habits so long ago. And each time that we engaged in the kind of selfishness that we took from the earth and gave nothing back, uh, we find that uh, each time we probably said to ourselves, Oh, it doesn't matter. It's just one small area of the earth. What's a little piece of the rainforest? It won't matter. I'll get so much. And there's so much rainforest left to use. Well, see, but everybody thinks like that, and pretty soon we have real problems. Well, we're like that in our own personal life. Whenever we engage in different kinds of thought processes, we think to ourselves, oh, it doesn't matter. I'll just, I'll just let myself think this judgment on someone else. I'll, I'll let myself do that. Or I'll let myself engage in this kind of hateful activity. I'll, I'll feel some hate in my mind or some real anger. Or I'll let myself really think badly of another person. Or maybe I'll just, um, I won't be generous right now. I'll just take what I need and I'll, I'll go with that. And once I feel better, then maybe I'll be generous later. Or maybe, uh, maybe I, I won't think about this person right near me who obviously needs some help. I'll just, I'll do what I need to do right now, and later when I feel better, I'll get back to it. Well, we don't realize that each one of those thoughts, each time that we engage in that kind of activity, we rob the future. In the same way that when we engaged in things that, in activities that took from the earth, we robbed the future, and now the earth is, def is deficient in many ways. It's the same with us. We have robbed ourselves in the past we have been our own worst enemy, robbing ourselves uh, in, this, in this time. And now we have maybe feelings of sadness. Sometimes we have feelings of loneliness. We have feelings of depression. We have feelings of dissatisfaction. And it seems that we might have everything. It seems that we might have everything. But still we're dissatisfied. And it seems that we just can't quite get happy. There are so many different feelings that we have right now that we can't understand where it is they come from. We can't really find how it is that they, they come about. And then we realize when we study that unfortunately we in the past have robbed ourselves. We have created deficits, cause and effect relationships that now plague us in our minds. Fortunately it is so with human beings that we are able to turn that around. Maybe it isn't so with the earth, because the earth is a more solid kind of thing. You, you can't, with your mind, instantly grow trees that you, that you chop down. But you can, with your mind, replace thoughts of, of hatred with thoughts of kindness and generosity and caring. You can, you know, you can look in your mind and you can see that you have leveled a whole forest by thinking only of yourself, only of yourself consistently, only what makes me happy. But you can actually replant that forest instantly by thinking thoughts of generosity and benefiting others. You can, th by thinking thoughts of, of wishing that all sentient beings would be free of suffering, wishing it from the depth of your being, wishing it from the heart, and then doing what you can to be sure that all sentient beings are free of suffering. Now you wonder, how can I do that? 
Because, you know, there are many different thoughts that you might come up with, and some of them might not be very pleasing to you. And also, you might have some confusing thoughts. You think, you might think, well, what, what am I supposed to do now? Am I supposed to empty out my bank accounts and give it to the poor or donate it to the temple? Or what am I supposed to do like that? It's not like that at all. It's really not like that at all. First of all, we have to understand the root cause of suffering. We must understand the root cause of suffering, and we must understand the antidote to suffering. And here's, here's where we get duped again. We keep forgetting. It's just like forgetting that there is cause and effect relationship. It's just like forgetting that what we do now matters in the future. And it's like forgetting that everything is impermanent, and it's like forgetting that everything that is born must die. We constantly forget what it takes to be happy, even though we might have had the teachings. The Buddha teaches us that due to the nature of cyclic existence, because of the nature of cyclic existence, since everything that is born must die, since everything that meets must separate, since everything that begins must end, and since cyclic existence is filled with change and uh, impermanence, there is nothing suitable that we can rely on in cyclic existence as a safe harbor, meaning that you can't count on cyclic existence to cause happiness. In fact, the Buddha goes even further in saying that in cyclic existence, cyclic existence is pervaded with suffering, that there really isn't any happiness in cyclic existence, because even when one has happiness, attached to that happiness is the sorrow of loss of that happiness. And strangely, each one of us have experienced that, and yet we continue to grasp onto cyclic existence, trying very hard to make ourselves happy. And in making ourselves happy and not caring for others, we only create more cause for suffering and loneliness and dissatisfaction in the future. So, what, what then is happiness? And the Buddha teaches us that while we are revolving in this condition of cyclic existence, dependent on karma, sometimes experiencing temporary happiness, but having that, temp that happiness always end, and always experiencing a mixed menu of different kinds of experience, that one should therefore seek the more permanent kind of happiness, which is called enlightenment. Now, the difference between enlightenment and samsara, well, there are many differences, and it would be very hard to try to explain, really, the difference between enlightenment and samsara. But in the state of enlightenment, one's happiness is not dependent on conditions. Because the state of enlightenment is actually considered to be a conditionless state. It is a natural, spontaneously arising, uh, conditionless state which is free of any distinction, free of any um, conceptualization, free of any um, mm, contrivance at all, is the natural blissful state. And one can only attain that state when one has completely abandoned cyclic existence and moved toward and sees as the only source of refuge that precious awakened state called enlightenment. Only in doing that can we actually achieve enlightenment. You won't find it in the forest. You won't find it in the ocean. Sometimes we think we're going to find it at the beach, but it never happens. Um, we won't find it anywhere on this earth. We won't, find it under, we won't find it at Christmas, and we won't find it on our birthday, and we won't find it when we get presents, and we won't find it when we have a car. There's nowhere in cyclic existence that we can find enlightenment. No matter where we look, and we do look, we look very hard for relief. The only way that one can find enlightenment is to pacify one's mind to the point that one frees one's mind of desire, of hatred, greed, and ignorance. These are the root causes of all suffering, and these are the root causes of all conditioned cause and effect arising, conditioned response. And upon pacifying these root causes, one then begins to awaken to the precious awakened state. Now, 
that sounds very simple, and we think, well, okay, now I'll pacify hatred, I'll practice generosity, and now I'll, pract- I'll pacify ignorance, I will practice the path, and I will learn the path, and I will accomplish the path, and I will take hold of my mind and cause it to work for me on the path. And now I'll practice greed. I won't grasp onto cyclic existence. I'll look only toward the objects of refuge. I'll look only toward the state of precious awakening. Why is that so much more easily said than done? It is so much, so, so easy to talk about and so hard to do because at every moment we seem to slip back into the comfort zone, the comfortable way of thinking that we have, that somehow, somewhere in our immediate environment, we can make ourselves happy. And one of the greatest faults of cyclic existence is that it seems temporarily that we can. For short periods of time we can, and it feeds us just enough sugar so that we keep on dancing constantly. But we're fooled. And the way that we turn our mind towards Dharma, and these are, again, back to the original, the initial foundational teachings that we must accomplish, is that we have to turn our mind towards Dharma by convincing ourselves and making ourselves understand the, the very nature of cyclic existence, how it comes about, what, what does it constantly produce, and what can it never produce. It constantly produces temporary arising conditions, and it never produces permanent blissful state, permanent happiness. We must understand how it is that cyclic existence comes about and how it is that it's faulted. It's faulted in that everything that happens must end. And it's faulted in that everything is impermanent. And it's faulted in that while we are in cyclic existence, it seems that we are always grasping towards happiness, and in doing that, we really create a lot of suffering for ourselves. So we have to remind ourselves constantly, turning our minds, turning our minds, turning our minds. And our minds are kind of like wild beasts in the beginning. They jump, you know, they jump at every opportunity. Every time it looks like they can get out of the, of the, of the confinement of having to think this through in a very logical fashion, that mind's going to try to jump the fence every time. It's going to try to jump the fence. You can put the teaching right around you and you can say, look, it's always been this way. You've never been permanently happy. You've always been disappointed in cyclic existence. What are the chances that it's going to change once for the first time? What are the chances? It's always been so. Not only you, but everybody else. Look at everybody else. And then, and then even if this life is perfect, it will end. And what you will have is the quality of your mind. That's, the, that's what you will take into your next incarnation. So you look at that and you set up all of these fences around yourself and you start to tame the mind. You put the mind in a corral like a wild animal and you start talking to it soothingly. You say, look, look, mind. <laughs> kind of talk to yourself like a crazy person in a way. You can tell a good Dharma practitioner, they're always talking to themselves. Look, you know you can't get away with this. You know you can't. You never have before. Why should you now? They, they, they look kind of funny and then they wear those funny clothes. And, you know. <laughs> but anyway, they're good people and they're trying their best. But you, you look at yourself and you, you put yourself in this corral and, and you try to convince yourself, you try to make yourself understand, you know. Look, you've been, you've been trying to make yourself happy. You've been trying to satisfy your desire for how long now? You're 41 years old, 41 years old, and you, and you still haven't, you haven't done anything. What have you done? You've only made yourself more self-absorbed. you only thought about yourself all this time. And, and, then, and you've, you've tried to become satisfied with cyclic existence. And just when you thought it had, you had it knocked, you lost a job, or you, you moved, and you lost friends, or you lost a relationship, or you lost, or you, someone died, or you know, something happened like that. And what does it come to in the end? What does it come to in the end? In the end, you lose it all. So you start talking to yourself that way, very soothingly, very lovingly, and you put yourself in this fence, and pretty soon the beast starts to calm down. It starts to calm down, and it kind of looks around and says, Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I better, I better, better get busy. Better put my nose, better wear the harness. Better put that harness on. Better put the bit in my mouth. Better start pulling. Better start pulling because I really have to, I have to get something done here. There's something to be done. 
And just when you think you've got the bit in the horse's mouth, the darn thing, you just leave the door open one bit, and boom, it's out again. It's, it's crazy how we are. That's just how our minds are. So constantly we really need to enforce and reinforce this Dharma teaching, this turning the mind toward Dharma. The difficulty is that for the most part, we are our own worst enemies, aren't we? We, let our, we, are, we don't take ourselves by the hand. We don't walk ourselves through the steps that we need to accomplish in order to help ourselves. Mostly we abandon ourselves. Mostly we just leave ourselves in the lurch. Mostly we think in short-term way, term ways. We think, oh, I'll just do what I want to right now, and I won't invest anything in the future. I'm thinking about a wonderful teaching one of the little children gave, my daughter. She said, um, we were talk, uh, I was asking her, what, what is one of the worst sufferings in cyclic existence here in a class? And she said, um, she hates to see the hunters and the animals. You know, we have so many hunters and animals around here. She hates that worst of all. She thinks that's the worst suffering in cyclic existence. And I said, why is that so bad? And she said, because in the future, the animals will be the hunters, and the hunters will be the animals, and it will just continue. She didn't use the word continue, but she meant it would just keep happening. It would just keep happening. And that's it, you know, that's it. The hunter, when he shoots the animal, he thinks he's getting meat, and he thinks he's giving himself a good time. He's having a great day hunting. Think about that. He's having a great day hunting. He likes it. He likes to hunt. He likes to be out there. And he likes the sport, the feeling of sport. And he gets a real rise out of it. And when he finishes hunting, he thinks, Oh, gosh, I'm a hunter and I've had a great day hunting and now I can go home and drink some beer. And it's just great. You know, I'm having a great hunting day. This is wonderful. And what he doesn't realize is that he just betrayed himself utterly. He has betrayed himself. He could not have done himself worse than if he had taken a gun and shot himself. How little regard he has had for himself, that he would betray himself in this way. All our lives we look for someone who will not abandon us. We look for someone who will not abandon us. Don't we understand that it is we who abandon ourselves constantly? Because we bring about the causes of the... No one else brings about the causes of our future suffering. Only we do. And the suffering that we feel now in our silliness, in our fundamental forgetfulness, we ourselves put on our own heads. But we've forgotten. Forgotten again and again and again. How strange this condition of cyclic existence. It's like being on a drug, isn't it? It's like a narcotic. And it is really a narcotic. It has a narcotic effect on us. Even in terms of uh, uh, being involved in some kind of competitive sport, you know, we think, gee, everybody in America does that. Well, it's football season. Everybody should think about that. You know, even even thinking about that um, and, and wanting to be involved in ordinary things that ordinary people do, things that are exciting and fun, actually, ultimately, we do ourselves no favor because we create a kind of pridefulness and competitiveness in our minds that ultimately will bring us future suffering. So once again, we have betrayed ourselves. When will we stop? The first thing we have to do in order to be able to stop is to try to remember. Try to remember the teachings that really teach us that one cannot simply revolve in cyclic existence without any thought. One must understand the nature of cyclic existence and one must turn one's mind toward the kind of activity that will be of benefit. One must turn, turn one's mind toward Dharma. One must turn one's mind consistently and, and effortfully and continually turn one's mind toward those things that are of benefit to sentient beings. Turn one's mind toward enlightenment. so strange that we make careers out of trying to find the right relationship, trying to find the right loving relationship. Uh, women try to find men. Men try to find women. Mothers try to be comforted by their children. Children try to be comforted by their parents. Endlessly, endlessly seeking this love from one another. Uh, friends, friends come to friends for help. And always there's this coming together, trying to help one another, trying to 
you know, I'm not trying to help one else, trying to be helped by someone else, trying to be comforted by someone else, trying to, to uh, be in a relationship where finally we'll get what we need. And yet, how can, the, how can we ever hope that that will happen if we won't do ourselves the favor of not abandoning ourselves? How can we forget, think that someone else will not be forgetful where we ourselves have been forgetful? The fault of cyclic existence is just that, the inherent blindness that is part of it. And knowing that that blindness is there, we have to take great, effortful steps, intelligent steps, meaningful steps, toward circumventing that blindness, toward overcoming it. We can't wait for the blindness to go away naturally. We can't wait to grow up and get smart. I know lots of grown-up people that are not particularly smart. We have to take great steps toward, at last, turning our mind toward Dharma, toward being our own best friend. You know, what the Buddha said, well, some of his last words sounded something like, I have given you the path, now you have the path. Work out your own salvation. Come to understand your own salvation. You, you must take the steps. That ultimately it is up to us to do that. The good news is that we have that power in our hands. We have the path, and we can actually make it work for us. But the question is, will we have enough respect for ourselves? Will we have enough regard for ourselves? Will we have enough kindness toward ourselves to actually accomplish that purpose? That's one aspect. But the other aspect is that the Buddha requires that we look around at the suffering of sentient beings. If it were only us, you could almost understand why you would be so out to lunch. You think, oh, it's only one life, what's the big deal? But it isn't. All sentient beings are suffering. All sentient beings are suffering. And most of them have no idea that there even is such a thing as cause and effect. Most of them have no idea that anything they're doing now will create suffering in the future. Think of the hunters. They honestly don't know that they are creating such suffering for themselves. They don't know. They don't understand that. They're not bad people. They just don't understand. And it's the same as the person who robs a 7-Eleven store or something like that. They honestly do not understand that they are creating such suffering for themselves. They know that they are getting money, that they are getting power, that they have a kind of powerful satisfaction from that um, fast-moving, strong event that they just engaged in. The excitement of the chase, all those things are a factor in their particular mind state. They have no idea and could not even comprehend that they are creating such suffering for themselves that surely in the future someone they will come under attack. Someone will attack them. They will suffer greatly because of it. They don't understand that. How terrible is the condition of cyclic existence that we move endlessly bringing about cause and effect relationships we and all sentient beings and have no idea what we have brought upon ourselves. These are the things that one must consider in the beginning upon approaching the path. And these are the things that one must consider not only f this day and even you know, throughout the beginning of our seeking the path, but one must consider these thoughts from now until one achieves enlightenment. Only when one has achieved enlightenment can one be said to fully understand these thoughts. These are called the thoughts that turn the mind. Only one element on, of them, only one part of them. But how important that we finally take ourselves in hand and put that wild beast of a mind in the corral, get the bit in our mouth, and start pulling because we have some place to go. The, the, the description that we're given is that we should thought of ourselves as a person in a burning house, and the house is about to 
to, to burn us up. You know, we are in a burning house and there is only one door. And that door is right in front of us. Right in front of us. And that door will lead us outside, outside of the burning house. And we are just about to be burnt up by the fire. With that kind of determination, we should put the bit in our mouth and walk through the door of liberation. With that kind of determination. How much regard would you have for that door if, you, if it were the only door in a room that was a burning house, in a, in a burning house, if that were the only way out? Would you love that door or what? Would you get focused or what? You would get focused big time. You would get more focused than you could possibly imagine. So you have to think of approaching Dharma in that way. You have to think of approaching the path in that way. There's the door. What will you do? So these are some of the fundamental thoughts that turn the mind. I hope that you will utilize them in your daily life and to whatever degree you practice. There's no law that says you have to become uh, a, a great and an extensive practitioner to the degree that you meditate for 10 hours a day. And uh, there's, there's no law that says you have to take ropes, robes. There are many different ways that you can practice the Dharma, and there are many, di- many different degrees to which you can practice Dharma. But one thing that we can all do is we can begin to understand the faults of cyclic existence, and we can begin to practice generosity and kindness rather than hatred, greed, and ignorance. These are things that we can all do. If we make kindness our religion, we've come a long way. We've come a very long way. So to what degree you can practice, please, please take those teachings and begin to, to transform your mind through utilizing them and meditating on them. Nanda.